Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Business of Corporate Marriage, How to Evaluate Partner Program Effectiveness. My name is Allison Crawford, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Today's, uh, sorry, technology business research's focus is to provide business research to accelerate our clients' success, and this webinar is a part of these ongoing efforts to find new ways to support you and your business, helping you get the most out of your research investment. As we'll highlight during the session, partnering has become a necessity for any firm with plans to expand either their product capabilities or sales reach. To help our clients better understand how partners should be selected, TBR is conducting research into partner effectiveness and is revealing some interesting results. Our goal is to connect our readers to this cutting-edge research and provide actionable insight into the market and competitive strategies that translates into competitive advantage for our clients. Before we dig into the data, there are a few action items I'd like to cover. First, we're recording today's session and we'll be posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI channel. We encourage you to visit this channel to watch this presentation or any of the others that we've recorded. Second, we'd like to hear your opinions and thoughts on all the materials we're presenting. Please send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function. Alan will address them at the end of the presentation. Or if you'd like a direct client inquiry for more detailed discussion, please reach out to Alan at the end of the webinar to set up that discussion. Third. We'll send out the slides to everyone registered for today's webcast within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. You can also find the slides as well as our thought leadership pieces, other webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net <coughs> backslash TBR underscore market underscore insight. And we'll be providing you with all the social media links at the end of the presentation, so if you didn't catch that, don't worry, we'll get it to you at the end. Uh, with that, let me introduce Alan Kranz. Alan has been covering and writing about the software market for over seven years and is leading our research coverage in partner ecosystems. His strategic advice is helping several of our largest clients identify and select their partners to create better solutions and revenue streams. And with that, let me hand this over to Alan. Great. Thanks, Allison, and thanks, everybody, for joining in. So what we wanted to do with today's webinar is to highlight an area that we see increasing focus in terms of the, the three main levers that we um, see for vendors to impact the overall go-to-market strategy. So we'll focus much of today's presentation on a lot of the partner ecosystem research that we're doing, some of the findings that are coming out of that, as well as you know, our thoughts in terms of the right framework to go and, and look at evaluating the effectiveness of the different partner programs out in the market. But before we dive, uh, dove deep into that ally discussion, we want to take a step back because it really does take place in the broader context of go-to-market strategies for both vendors, partners, and customers in the market. So the three main areas of strategy that we see and focus on are the, the build, and within that we're including both the building the solutions and then also building the distribution channels with direct sales to bring those solutions to market. Secondly, the buy element where acquisitions come in and uh, investments come in to uh, bring in either technology assets um, and the sales and marketing engines that drive the distribution of those um, and how that can, those acquisitions can fit into the overall portfolio expansion as well as bolster the distribution capabilities for vendors participating in them, and then lastly, the partnership angle. So within each of them, we see both accelerate, accelerators and inhibitors taking place as we look at both the vendor strategy and the partner uh, perception in the market today. Starting with the, the build, and we'll go through each, each, of the, each of these a little bit more deeply, but what we see within the build segment is a real focus on innovation, adopting new technologies, um, a lot of that effort taking place internally, and the result is that R&D spend, as we measure it across the software industry, is um, increasing by double-digit rates year to year. Now, the flip side of that on the distribution side is that given the, the current market and the, um, the pressure on top lines, Sales and marketing growth has is, is been inhibited, so you have vendors uh, not increasing sales and marketing, not able to increase those budgets uh, to keep pace with the amount of innovation taking place. So it's forming a bottleneck in terms of how to actually 
go to market with those new solutions and technologies that are being developed on the build side. So a little bit of a mixed trend when we look at how that is playing out um, across the industry today. As we move over onto the, the buy side, this has been a critical element of a lot of the larger vendor strategies over the past decade. Um, and uh, when we take a look at some of the leading vendors there that really drove a lot of the activity over that time period, there's almost a universal decrease in terms of uh, the, both the volume and the amount of investment that's being made in acquisitions to both bring innovation in-house and bolster distribution capabilities. So on the inhibitor side, we see both the, the rising valuations and the expense involved with that as an inhibiting factor, but also an execution risk factor that increases as um, you, know, you have a slower overall spending environment. So those two things really dampering a little bit on the acquisition side. So all of that kind of builds up to a set of vendors that um, have expanded portfolios, new technologies, new offerings. They need to find a, a more effective way to bring those to market. Um, and with the constraints internally in terms of uh, how large those direct sales forces are going to get in today's environment, the, you know, that shifts the emphasis onto that partnership strategy, both from the big to big on the alliance side and on the, the broader distribution in terms of engaging the channel to be that distribution mechanism for the solutions that they're, that they're building internally and investing in to, to bring those to market. So a number of factors both within the partnership strategies overall, but also in the build and buy scenarios that surround that that are driving, we see an increased focus on partner programs as a key element of go-to-market strategies and garnering more investment from the vendors there in order to, to build that out. Um, so with that, you know, we're seeing much more inquiry around how to, how to measure and build more effective partner programs. Um, so, so we'll kind of go through that at, through, with today's presentation, but really critical element and only becoming more important as the, um, you know, the IT market shifts in terms of technologies, where the spending is happening, all that kind of combines to place an increased emphasis on partnerships in terms of bringing those um, new technologies to market. So as we go into, the, this is a deeper view inside of that build strategy, so bring some of the quantitative metrics that we see um, supporting a lot of the scenarios um, in, in terms of both the R&D and the sales and marketing dynamics within the set of customers that we cover. So the metrics that we have here come from our software benchmark, where we're covering 30 of the, the largest software vendors in the industry. So what I've done here is in the blue box, pulled together the R&D spend both in aggregate and the average for those um, around 30 vendors that we're covering so that you can, you can get a perspective for how that's changed over the, the past year. So these are full year calendar numbers. Um, so going from 27 to $30 billion in aggregate spend, more than 10% growth there. Um, so fairly significant expansion, even in an environment where, you know, we saw a lot of vendors challenged to grow the top line. Still a big focus on both uh, expanding the portfolio into complementary areas, building in more of a solutions focus, so pulling in more solutions into a package that really address more discreetly customer issues, um, as well as adopting new technologies, so looking at uh, you know, changing the delivery method for certain solutions, uh, and expanding more into a cloud and mobile environment, and making sure that the presence is built up there. A lot of that R&D spend is devoted to those those types of efforts. So certainly seeing the innovation side garner a, a good amount of increased spending over that time period. Contrasting that, we've pulled together the the total sales and marketing expenses for those vendors as well as the average per vendor. Um, and then the thing to note here is that, you know, just a much slower pace of expansion, much more conservative spending environment on the sales and marketing side. So we don't see the parity in terms of developing the innovative products and then really supporting them with 
um, internal sales and marketing investments. Um, so there, that we see creates a gap and a bottleneck in terms of how those solutions can actually be brought to market. So that's the background for the build side of the overall go-to-market strategy as we look at the vendors that we cover. The next one that I wanted to go through kind of in route to that, the partnership deep dive, is to take a look at the, the buy scenario because we have seen it be a, a real accelerator for a lot of vendors in terms of bringing new technologies in-house, being able to very quickly get to market and fill gaps in the portfolio, as well as expanding the sales reach and bringing in things that are very scalable and can contribute to the bottom line and the top line in a way that um, you know, has a fairly immediate impact for those vendors. So if we go a little bit more deeply about those advantages and disadvantages, you know, you'll notice that the, uh, we see the, the disadvantages or the inhibitors really kind of uh, you know, suppressing the activity here, particularly over the past year. Um, so with that, you, we've seen the, the rising valuations. If you look at the, the stock prices overall, they've come up quite a bit. So with that, it changes the ROI scenario in terms of evaluating those purchases. So we've seen more in innovation taking place internally rather than looking externally to go out and acquire those assets. As well as the, you know, the always prevalent execution risk, but I think that is heightened when you look at both the valuations and the types of companies that are being um, purchased and, and, and mo there's most activity around. So if you look at acquiring a traditional software company, a lot of times that model, you know, if you're already in the software business, there's less execution risk there than bringing in a net new technology asset that has a cloud or mobile delivery platform. Um, that's a that's a, both a business model shift um, that brings more execution risks there, um, and we see as inhibiting some of the growth and spending on the buy strategy side. So in order to break this out and provide some, some company examples, we'll sprinkle these through um, throughout the presentation. But IBM, you know, historically a big driver in the acquisition space, um, and so much so that for their business, acquisitions are a formal part of their 2015 EPS growth goals and the way that they're going to, you know, close that gap between their current rate of EPS and uh, um, I believe it's $20 a share in, uh, in 2015. So if you look at their plan as laid out in 2010, they were going to allocate $20 billion, you know, largely due to the, the valuation environment um, and the overall uh, focus on cost reduction. We've seen them be a little bit more conservative than originally planned in terms of how much they're going to allocate to acquisitions. Still taking place, certainly, you know, still some fairly large purchases if you look at a company like Conexa. But a big gap if you look at more than $8 billion, um, if they're going to actually deliver on that $20 billion estimate um, over the next two years, you know, certainly need to see a big acceleration in terms of the rate and size of purchases to take place over that time period. So certainly slower acquisition activity on their part than um, I think would have been predicted in, in 2010. And then HP, also a company that you know, on the software side, a lot of their assets are built off acquisitions over the past, um, particularly over the past five to ten years, and that this really highlights the, the execution risk area where following the autonomy purchase, they've really, you know, not, not used the, the buy strategy at all over the past five quarters um, as they focus on really integrating and leveraging the assets that they that they purchased with that buy, um, so points to some of the you know difficulties companies can face with acquisitions. We see it as another inhibitor for the overall level of activity in the, on the acquisition side um, as companies look at the overall go-to-market strategy. So to kind of wrap up the buy side, we still think it's going to be a critical component going forward of you know, bringing new technology in-house, getting that scalability, and expanding into new markets. Um, you know, but, but just over the past two years, I'd say the environment has been such that um, those types of purchases aren't as easy to make and justify. 
um, it leads us to our last point where we'll spend a little bit more time looking at the partnerships and alliance section and some of the things that we see both from the vendor, partner, and the customer side in terms of how that ecosystem comes together, how to measure it, and what some of the best practices we see coming out of that are. So to, to take a step back and kind of look at this overall engagement as it flows from vendor through the partner to the customer, the consistent uh, kind of perspectives that we see in terms of getting the right mix and having the right strategy really come down to three things, and we've represented them across all three actors here. And that's need, structure, and investment. And I think it's important because for a lot of the projects that we do, looking at how these ecosystems work, um, you know, what some of the learnings are in terms of how to improve some of our clients' ecosystems are, most times it really maps back to starting with the vendor, what is the, the business need and the desired outcome from the engagement with the partner community. Um, I think looking back over the past 10 years, we've seen numerous You've seen a lot of companies kind of quickly engage, promote certain partner strategies, um, but I think the, when the buy-in isn't there, when the business need and the driver for that activity isn't crystal clear on the vendor side, you don't get that buy-in throughout the organization, and that you know, shows up in terms of the commitment for partners and the resonance with customers as well. So starting with the vendor side, really understanding what their outcome is, how they're tracking that, how that relates to their broader business objectives and goals is a critical starting place for whether a program can, is set up to be successful and how committed a vendor is to that program. Flowing from there, if we look at the, the structure, again, this, this will map largely back to what the desired need and outcome is. So it needs, if it's gonna be a, a focused engagement, then the structure for that participation with partners needs to reflect that and be very focused and tactical in terms of who the customers are there that are gonna be served, um, what the boundaries are with direct sales, so that in effect it's set up to win in terms of mapping back to what you're trying to get out of it um, and what the application of the actual programs are. And then thirdly, you know, we, we do look at the investment side, but I think a lot of the um, success is set up in the, the earlier steps around what is the outcome and what is the structure. Um, the investment can, you know, be a, a pivotal area. You know, if some uh, either training or financial incentives aren't aligned correctly, um, you know, there, there can be issues there, but, you, you know, a lot of times, if you have the right financial incentives and, and levels of investment, but you don't have the right structure and the um, outcomes identified, um, there's a disconnect there and you'll see you know, just a, a disjointed partner program that doesn't get the same level of effectiveness that, that other programs are able to achieve. So that's on the, on the vendor side. You know, the other perspective that we, that we take is on, is on the partner side, and I think those three things still really resonate and are critically important. So with the need, determining a lot of our research looks at what do partners need? What are the areas of technology they need help? What types of structure and programs um, do they need in, or, in order to achieve what the, the goals and the outcomes are that are d disseminated down from the vendors? And then likewise, what else do they need in terms of justifying their own investment in terms of the, you know, whether it's marketing campaigns, um, share of the, the sales resources, what type of um, monetary things are involved with getting them to be able to do those activities. Um, certainly a different scale in terms of looking at the vendor and the partner of you know, what the financial resources are, but they're facing those same types of trade-offs as the vendors are with limited time and resources. Um, so, so that all goes into our, our perspective there. And in the end, it's about lining up with the customer. How do they want to buy? Um, what are the kind of uh, programs and uh, distribution methods that they want to engage with? Um, and then, you know, what, what's the pricing scenario in terms of 
the value add that the partner is bringing to the table um, and, and comparing that with some of the other routes to market that are that are available. So it, it differs from, from the perspective and our research is set up to, um, to mimic that, but really it comes down to those three things when we look at evaluating the overall effectiveness of, of partner ecosystems. So after, after setting up the high level, I'll take you through a couple examples and, and kind of case studies to, to call out some of those things that we just went through on the overall ecosystem perspective. So when we, when we think about need, one of the things that we've identified is for, for vendors where partner programs aren't you know, an ingrained part of their history, and there's a number of them out there, um, and it seems to be a universal focus for expanding into the, the partner community, um, supplementing some of the direct sales investments that have been made historically, and really building out that, that partner arm of their overall go-to-market strategy. Um, one vendor that you know, we, we look at and, and, and cover, and I think it's an, a great case study for really getting down to what the need is. Um, because in the case of EMC, you had a company that for a long time was engaged in a um, you know, uh, marriage of, of convenience to, to some degree with Dell. Um, it was a quick way for them to get into the channel and grow some indirect revenue by leveraging that relationship. And then they faced a, a turning point as that started to erode in terms of how all of a sudden, um, when you look at their results, it was a significant portion that was driven through Dell, and they were faced with this need to supplement that and to offset the impact of that in terms of their in terms of their results. So it was a very distinct need for them, and I think it drove a lot of their you know the improvement and contributions they've seen through the indirect channel over the past over the past couple of years uh, because they they did feel such a uh, acute and distinct need to more broadly engage through the channel um, and, and build up that ecosystem so the way that they did it you know first you know looking at the structure they needed to make some very distinct changes to the, the structure of both the indirect and direct sales organizations so that there was that clear playing field, so that uh, starting with the structure, the channel was set up to succeed within their organization, and it would be something where partners would uh, come in and invest and, and build up that stream of revenue around the, the EMC solutions. That even flowed through into uh, channel-only products, so that they were able to, again, segment what portions of the portfolio partners were able to, to resell into reserve that solely for their use. I think those are the major elements that we see impacting their overall um, expansion in the channel. Um, and then you see more incremental, you know, we see in terms of the financial incentives, some of the things around V-specs, you know, continuing to enhance those is, is part of it, but really starting with the, the need and the structure determine their, uh, their path forward in terms of growing the indirect uh, the indirect channel contributions. So when we look a little bit about how that plays out in terms of their customer mix, it um, speaks to another kind of driver that we see overall for further engaging with the channel is reaching that smaller segment of customers. Um, EMC wasn't alone in terms of relying largely on large enterprises for a majority of their revenue, um, and that still remains true today. However, they have largely through the channel been able to grow within the SMB segment and uh, lead in terms of growth um, for the overall company as you look at you know the SMB uh, growing at a faster rate than the overall business and, and the large enterprise segment. So it has been something that's contributed positively to their overall results um, and increased their uh, presence in a space where they didn't previously have a large um, install base in the, the smaller customer sets. Continuing on, on the EMC path, because I think this is an interesting adjunct to the overall kind of partner strategy. Um, and again, it's not a majority of our focus in terms of the research, but uh, when you look at the diversity of vehicles being used by a company like EMC, it's, it's fairly unique. Um, and again, speaks to looking downstream at the, the customer set, identifying you know, 
what they're buying, uh, what's driving their buying decisions, what type of who they want to buy from essentially, and what type of organization needs to be wrapped around that in order to enable those sales. So you see a, just a multitude of different vehicles. Um, pr probably the largest for them would be VCE, where they saw the need <clears throat> very distinctly to have a single face to the customer, single point of uh, support and delivery, and because of that, the need to go and create a separate entity <clears throat> that would be able to deliver all those elements so that when you're delivering a converged device, it's not a collection of, of different products. It really is an integrated package. It's sold to you by a single entity, and it's supported by a single entity. Um, so, there's, so there's that strategy. You have you know, the alliance with VMware, just multiple points of intersection between those two companies, but we've seen overall a tightening of that alliance. Um, and that, you know, for them, it's, it's not just about the alliance, it's about all of the partner activity that VMware brings to the table. So another way that um, EMC is able to both, you know, bolster the presence of, um, its own presence in the VMware ecosystem, but um, have a bigger channel play as well. Um, and then, you know, can't be another instance where they were able to join with VMware, another point of their interaction, um, a, another uh, separate entity with a, you know, a little bit different focus in terms of the end customer being, um, you, you know, in a different region as well as trying to bolster that uh, cloud and developer presence um, as key routes to market into growing segments. So another perspective we wanted to bring in um, and highlight some of the, the top level findings that we see is to take a step below the vendor perspective. Um, you know, we've covered a number of different angles there and look a little bit more deeply at the partner side. Um, because, you know, again, the vendor programs are great. It sets the groundwork. But understanding the perspective from the partner up into the vendor ecosystem I think is an important part of the research and understanding their needs, requirements, perception of different vendors, you know, allows you to, to, to speak in a language that resonates with them and uh, improve the overall perception of, of the programs that, that have been laid out. So, so when we talk with, with partners over the past, um, you know, two years, some of the things that, that came out, it's a little bit of a dichotomy when you look at what their needs are. Because at a higher level, we see this need for assistance in terms of making the leap to new technologies, understanding what their value proposition is around things like cloud, mobile, uh, private cloud. Those are all things that, to some degree, threaten the, uh, the businesses, business models that they've built um, and highlight the need for them to continue to evolve just as the vendors have in terms of delivering value around the changing customer requirements. So things like um, financing assistance. For these, the working partners, a lot of times the working capital is a, is a big challenge for them. They don't have the big cash reserves um, some of the vendors have in terms of building new areas of the business while maintaining those things that keep the lights on today that's a diff more difficult balancing act for a lot of the, uh, the distribution partners out in the market today. So any type of consulting, uh, assistance, uh, building a bridge from their current business model and offerings to the new one is something that comes up again and again that I need more help in order to, to make that transition. So with that higher level, one of the ways that you know we're measuring it um, partner need in a more discrete way is, is laid out here. So we're using a matrix here and taking people through the life cycle of, um, of partner engagement. Um, so it starts with kind of the, the overall partner management, goes right through the more discrete aspects of helping me sell, helping me get it delivered. And so when we laid that out, the, the finding is that for a lot of the partners as they're reporting back, it's all about capturing the deals. If you can help me, enable me, and support me through that deployment, that helps me close more deals and keeps my revenue streams up. 
So that is, you know, when you start to talk to people, the focus for them is closing business, getting more tactical support in order to do that. Um, so from the vendor perspective, that's obviously the most granular and um, least scalable part of, of how they can support partners. So there's a, uh, there's a struggle there in terms of what type of resources can be actually be delivered down to the partners. Um, and then the obvious quandary for the vendors is how do you segment that and um, provide that to the most, uh, most productive partners? How do you identify them and then how do you structure it so that they get the resources they need and uh, there's a sliding scale in terms of where the resources go. But the other interesting thing is if you shift over to the left, those par portions that are a little bit uh, less important when we went out and pulled people, things like partner management, um, support, those are things that on the inbound side are, are critical in terms of expanding the, the customer base, having an impact early on in the, the partner life cycle, you know, before you ever get into the, the deal specific support. Um, so I think it's a, it's a balancing act. Uh, the other thing to highlight here is we ask people on a scale of one to three across the different areas of the life cycle. Um, and so there is a little bit of a distribution, but you notice the scale starts at a two. So there's not a lot of elements of the partner life cycle that um, you know, just aren't important at all. Seems to all be important, but to varying degrees. And um, anything below anything below the line, there's, uh, there's uh, more, more dissatisfaction. Above the line, there's uh, more satisfaction in terms of the, the importance scale. And so you can see that some of the earlier, st earlier stages of the life cycle, they're less important. Um, there's less kind of uh, satisfaction levels compared with that importance. Um, so it's a little bit of a difficult uh, balancing act between making sure you do enough there to onboard the right partners and then um, segmenting the levels of investment to those most productive partners as you go out to the right. So, but, but overall, the, some of the, the issues and the opportunities we see in terms of the programs is more help in terms of the, the business model consulting, helping them target the, the new areas of growth and technology without uh, taking their eye off the ball in terms of the day-to-day the -day, um, elements of the portfolio that, that really drive their current business. So kind of with those perspectives, you get a little sense for how we view this market, um, the elements that we think are important in terms of how to go out and build more effective partner ecosystems. So to go a little bit deeper in terms of our streams of research, we're really looking at it from each perspective in the overall ecosystem. So from the vendor perspective, we highlighted a little bit about EMC, but we're really looking at both covering more vendors and getting more granular in terms of what the need is, what the structure is, um, all the things that they're doing to really set these things up for success and uh, leverage the channel in a way that uh, ties back to their overall corporate goals. On the partner side, a lot of our focus right now is on new things like how can they make the transition to cloud, what are the business models that are going to drive, uh, that are going to sustain them as the mix shifts from traditional solutions over to, to cloud solutions, and also what's the right distribution model for them so that it's a sustainable business. Um, some of the things that we've seen there, uh, I don't think it's you know established yet in terms of what the best practices are, um, but, but that the, the sales model will shift. We've spoken to a number of uh, kind of leading vendors here who are using a, a lighter touch sales model less kind of traditional commission-driven approach, uh, more lighter touch resources that match the uh, financial model in terms of the uh, subscriptions coming in on a more distributed basis over time rather than the, the big license deals that drove a lot of their, their business model previously. And then on the customer side, you know, taking the perspective up in the market in terms of what are the vendors that they want to interact with, how do they want to buy? Is the you know for what solutions are partners the right distribution channel? What value can they add? Um, and so what the mix of technology and, and how they're purchasing, 
how that plays out across all the elements of the portfolio because it certainly is a diverse environment. Uh, we focus in on the software and cloud spaces, but um, certainly cover the, the hardware side as well in terms of how, how to make those models work and how, from the customer perspective, that uh, mix of direct and indirect sales come to, comes together around different workloads and, and solutions. So with that, um, as Allison said, we'll be posting this online. Feel free to contact me you know, through email or, or, or Twitter. Happy to interact more around this and provide some of the things that, that we're seeing in the market. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Allison so that we can go through some questions. Great. Thanks, Alan. Uh, and thanks. We've got a couple questions come through. I'd like to encourage anyone that has any questions to send them through now. Um, Alan, the first question we got was, how will private cloud impact the partner strategies for vendors and distribution partners? So when we think about the, the ways of change coming through for uh, partner models, you know, I think right now the, the public cloud is a bigger uh, bigger emphasis for a lot of the partners that we speak with. Um, but we see private cloud on the horizon in terms of the shift in, in adoption happening. And, and I think it's stalled a little bit as you look at where we see the customer sets that are adopting these types of solutions. Um, certainly on the, on the bigger side today, in terms of the number of customers that are actually building their own private cloud environments. So that in and of itself limits a little bit uh, the broader distribution involvement there. Um, you know, we don't see heavy involvement, you know, on the VCE side with partners as of yet, um, although some of the portfolio changes, you know, open up a little bit broader segment of the market. But I think overall, it's, you know, I think private cloud will actually be an easier transition for a lot of the a lot of the distribution partners, the smaller partners, because it ties back to things that they're more comfortable selling and that they're more uh, accustomed to from a business model perspective. So if they can make it through the public cloud shift, um, I think private cloud is a uh, smaller step up in terms of changing a little bit of the architecture, uh, some of the assets involved. But overall, it's a better fit for their business model and their technology focus. Okay. Uh, the other question has come through so far. Uh, what trends have you seen for how vendors are coordinating direct and indirect sales efforts? So, so I, th I think the overall trend that we've seen is, uh, uh, I'll call it optimization of, of the mix. And so that varies, you know, certainly by customer set is the biggest area where you know, you, there's kind of clear lines of delineation and they can um, create certain floors for the direct sales force in terms of the size of customers that um, that are targets for them and also reserve ceilings for uh, the the distribution partners to come in and, and cater to, the, to those customers. Um, so that's, you know, customer set is the, the first way. I think that's the clearest and easiest. Also seen, you know, some mixture in terms of the, the types of uh, offerings that are being sold. So you have a vendor like Symantec that um, largely reserves consulting, um, decision I think a couple of years ago, to reserve consulting engagements for, for their partners to, to a large degree. They still do some uh, on their own, obviously, but, um, you know, so it splits by the types of offerings. Um, you know, that also flows over to uh, companies like EMC where certain products are exclusively reserved for, for partners. It's not just a services play. Um, so I think, it, I think it varies per vendor. We've also seen geographic differences in terms of, um, you, you know, regions with a lower direct sales presence, maybe exclusively channel or, um, you know, th that type of focus to really provide the playing field, cl clear playing field for partners to come in and um, sell vendor solutions. Okay, the next question we had came through. Um, what do you see on the trend of partnering with ODMs directly versus with OEMs? Um, so on, on the ODM versus versus ODM um, question, we have, so, so a lot of our, so I focus on on the software side. So, but I can speak a little bit to the um, on the ODM side, and I, I think that adds a, another layer layer of complexity in terms of looking at the the big to big alliances 
and how to get the right mix in terms of the branded solutions, non-branded solutions. Um, so, I, so I think, I don't know, I, th I think that's probably best reserved for the hardware side. Um, okay. It doesn't have as big of an impact for the, the cloud and software. All right. Um, we'll follow up with that person to yeah. see if they want to have a conversation with our hardware team. Um, doesn't look like we have any other questions, so I'm going to throw it out one more time in case anybody wants to send something through right now. Bueller. All right, apparently not. So as promised, um, we have all the social media links here. Uh, you can follow both Alan and TBR at the handles listed here. Uh, there is the slide share and YouTube channel. So as Alan and I both mentioned, um, these presentations will both be up on SlideShare and YouTube by tomorrow afternoon. We will be sending out the slides to you guys as well. If you have a pressing need to get access to this, please send me a note or send Alan a note. We can send the stuff along to you directly. Um, uh, as well, uh, we have a short survey uh, when you're, as you're exiting the webinar. If you guys could take that and give us some feedback on the presenter quality, the presentation quality, and any other feedback that you think would help make our presentations better. We are incorporating that as we go quarter to quarter uh, to improve the delivery of what we're bringing to you guys uh, in our webinar series. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending. If you have any questions, we'll leave the chat function open for a couple of minutes. And as Alan mentioned, this is ongoing research. So if there are questions you guys have in the next couple of weeks, please feel free to reach out to us. If you have interest in getting access to um, the research that's already been delivered, you can also reach out to Alan or myself or either Stuart or James that are listed on this webinar uh, slide. So we thank everyone for your time today, and we look forward to talking with you guys all going forward. Have a great afternoon, everyone.